Okay, so oops, that's not what I meant to do, sorry. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about packages. We've already seen a bunch of this in different contexts. Hopefully this will tie things together a little bit more coherently than, than, on, than I've done on the fly so far. So as I've already said, packages are basically you know, one of the main things that sets R apart from other software. There's so much um, functionality that people have added into R on, um, as contributed packages. And we can, if we go to the CRAN website, we can see all the packages. And if we just sort them by name, and we start scrolling down, you start to see, you know, I'm not even to the end of the A's, and I had already flicked through this a few. Um, you know, so there are thousands and thousands of packages in here that do all sorts of different things in all sorts of different domain science and social sciences, domains of, of science and social sciences. Um, and one of the things that's, one thing that's nice is this tasks view, because there have gotten to be so many packages, it's hard to even get a sense for what's out there and what's, what's useful. So this task views um, shows you what are some of the packages associated with various topics. So you can see, okay, there's a variety of packages associated with doing Bayesian statistics, and you can get a sense and some description of what those are. Um, there are a variety of packages associated with finance and with graphics and that sort of thing. So this gives you a little bit of an entree into the world of the various packages um, in, a, in a bit of a guided way. Um, not too much else I'm going to say there. Um, so this, this is really what we I would have, should have gone over earlier, but um, then we served on on the fly, which is the two-step process is you first need to, yeah, question. Can we just assume all the packages are <laughs> Yeah, that's an excellent question. It was, I was going to get to it at some point. Absolutely not. So, you know, and you could write a package without knowing anything about R and do it really badly and put it up there, and no one's going to know that it's good or bad, right? Um, so there, it's sort of buyer beware. You have to, you, you sort of want to try and get a sense from, um, sometimes you can get a sense for who wrote it and whether there's somebody who contributes a lot to R. Um, sometimes if you're searching um, on the various mailing lists um, or in Stack Overflow, and we'll see that in a, in a little bit, you can see that lots of people talk about a particular package. Like you would see pretty quickly that lots of people talk about ggplot2 and get a sense that it's really heavily used and that probably means that it's higher quality that bugs have been found and people wouldn't be using it if it weren't very good. But there are lots of packages that you know, somebody wrote and maybe three people have used them over the course since they've been, been created. So the two-step process for packages to get them is you need to install the package on your machine. That's the install the packages that you guys have, have carried out for some of these packages. And then you need to actually load the package into your session of R where you're actually working and going to use it. And the reason that, that you don't, that all of the packages are not you know, that we don't load thousands of packages into our R session. It's just it would take time to load all that in. And we would also have lots and lots of um, coll collisions between the names of different things. So maybe my package has a function called um, N nnet for neural net. And then somebody else wrote a package that has nnet for, you know, some other neural network functionality. And so you end up getting these sorts of conflicts. Um, the other thing to note is, um, th this may have already come up for some of you, is that you can tell R where, to, where in your file system on your computer to, inst to install the package. And if you don't have administrative privileges on the particular machine that you're working on, that you can still install packages in your home directory that you have access to, even if you can't install onto, into some of the places on the machine. And that's with this lib argument, which it says where, where, to, where to install the package. Um, the other thing to note is there's, there are dependencies built into packages. So if I'm writing a package and I want to do some fancy plotting of some particular kind of model, maybe I'm going to have my package use the ggplot2 function. So then I would, I, would, I would set up my package so that it depends on ggplot2 and that when I load my package into R, by default it also loads ggplot2. So you'll see some of that happening behind the scenes when you install, whether you're either when you're installing a package or loading a package, that some other things may get installed and or loaded um, as well. Um, okay. Um, there are a couple of uh, functions that occasionally um, come in handy for trying to understand sort of what's going on with uh, different packages and where, where R is finding stuff. So if you type search, um, This basically shows if R, if you tell R the name of an object or a function and it goes to try and look for it, it's going to basically look in various locations, basically sort of various workspaces or environments to go find that object. And this basically shows the ordered um, set of places that it will look. 
So first it's going to look in what's called the global environment to see if, you're, if the function or object that, you're, um, that you reference in your code is found there. If it doesn't find it there, it'll then start going upstream. It'll, it'll, in this particular case, it'll look in the grid extra package, which we had loaded before for doing ggplot2. Then it'll look in grid, then it'll look in lattice, and so on and so forth. And you can see up here at the top here are some of sort of the core packages that, that come with R such as the graphics package, the stats package, the base package, things like that. So uh, I was about to say something that I think I would have, where I would have gotten ahead of myself, so let me, let me not say that yet. Um, and if you want to know where R is getting, where R is, um, where R is trying to install uh, packages, you can do this dot libpaths function, and it'll show you that the first place it tries to install is just in my home directory in this particular path. And then it's also the second place it might try to install is in this sort of system level directory here. Question? So if a couple of packages use the same command, I assume that it'll kind of search in this order as far as which when right. it's accessing. Is right. there, um, are there any, I don't know, I just like clever ways to keep track of this issue or uh, it occasionally comes up. I mean, this search function is useful. Um, we're going to see a way to make sure that, it, that you can explicitly tell it to use a, a, the function from a particular package, and we'll see that in a minute. Um, and then if you do search paths, it'll show you that, it'll show you the different packages, or it'll show you the different environments where there are different, where objects are, are stored, including the various packages. And it'll show you where it's getting the package from. So it looks like grid extra in, is installed in my local home directory on this machine. But um, the lattice and the grid package are both installed on sort of a system level directory. So that's occasionally useful for, to understand that. Um, so let me go back here. Oops. So this. Um, we can, we can query and try and see what are the objects associated with a given package. Um, and it's useful, that's, that's useful to uh, get a sense for, for what's available. So we can do something like ls. So remember, we've seen ls to just say what's in our global workspace. But instead of just saying ls without any arguments, I can say ls and then give it in quotes package stats. And in this case, I'm just going to print out the first 20 things. So these are the first 20 objects alphabetically that are in the stats package. And you can see there are sorts of things you might expect associated with statistics. There are a bunch of things having to do with ANOVA, um, ACF, AIC, sort of statistical things that, that start with the letter A. Um, and I'm going to go back to our studio for this next piece. Um, so basically the idea of dealing with these name collisions is that each package has something called a namespace, which is basically what in our terminology is um, basically a little environment in which the objects are sort of stored um, for a specific package. And by, by sort of grouping the objects for different packages separately, it allows R to sort of manage these things in a more coherent way. Um, so I can do things like this. I can create my own LM function, even though there already is one in the stats package. And if I do that, I just create a silly function here. But now if I run my LM function, it just prints back whatever I gave into it, right? So this is obviously a toy function. Um, and if I, if I accidentally did this sort of thing of sort of overwriting the LM function, you know, now it's not going to do, it's not going to fit a linear model anymore because I overwrote it. Um, but I actually did, it's not really overwritten. It's just hidden for the time being. And the reason that it's, the reason that when I invoke LM here that it's trying to use my LM is because when I create my LM, it's sitting in that global workspace, that global environment. And that's where R looks first before it marches upwards and looks in the stats package. That was that search that we saw. So in this case, it looks, you know, it, it finds my LM before it finds the, the stats package LM, and so it uses mine. But if I really want to force it to use the one from the stats package, I can use this operator double colon, and that'll say, oh, go look in the stats package to get the LM function. And that will still work to actually run a regression. Okay, the other thing that's nice to be aware of and that it comes, turns out to be um, handy every so often oops, is um, 
that we can actually look at the code inside a package directly. And this might be either our code or in some cases there's C, there is C or Fortran code that's included in a package. So if you really wanted to know what exactly was going on with some algorithm that somebody had written in a package, you might actually need to go into the code and look at it yourself. Um, and if you're operating in Linux or in the terminal on a Macintosh, you can do something like download the underlying zip file, um, and the, uh, these, these tar.gz are sort of a Unix format zip file. You can download the underlying um, file from CRAN. You can see this is on the, the, the CRAN website. You can unzip it, that's what this line of code does here. And once you unzip it, you th can then go into the directory and look around in the directory. And typically, what's going to um, happen is, is in, an, in an R, when you unzip that file, um, there's going to be then, say if, I, say if I downloaded the fields package, there's going to be a directory called fields. And within there, there's going to be one called R, there's going to be another one called man, and another one called source sometimes. So this will have all of the actual R code for anything that's in the package, and you could just go look in, look in, those, fun, in those files and look at the R code. This will have the raw um, files that are used in creating the help, func the, help for, uh, the help information for, a given, for the different functions. And if there is C or Fortran code included in the package, it'll be in this SRC directory. And if there's any data objects associated with the package, those will be in uh, a directory called slash data. So you can go in and look at these things directly, and that, that is sometimes uh, helpful to be able to do that. The reason that you need to go to, to sort of download this tar.gz file directly from the website is the version of the package that is actually installed on your computer, all the R code and the help files are already sort of processed and, and not accessible directly to you. They're sort of packaged up in a format that R can access really easily, but that you can't as a human sort of go in and look at um, very easily. So you need to go through this uh, sort of process. Questions or comments at this point? Yeah. Uh, a lot of packages are just R code. Many packages have R code, and then for some of the computationally in intensive steps, they call some C code behind the scenes. And I guess there are occasionally some packages where it's almost all C code, and there are just a few little small R functions that do the accessing of the C code. Um, but in any case, sort of an answer to the other part of your question, that C code will be, uh, just as a text file of C code, that'll be in this SRC directory, so you can go in and look at it. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. So the R file here, the R code here, we can, we can see that in the R code here or something? Yeah, you could open any, any file that's in this directory in a given package that you've downloaded and unzipped with the commands that I showed you here. You can just look at those files in a text editor. You can look at them with it. You can open them up in our studio. You can, you can, yeah, they're text files, so you can open them however you want to. And do the, like, multiple files? Or, I mean, yeah, often people, this sort of goes back to Jared's comment about um, how you choose to organize your files, is that people often will try to have a bunch of separate files that are sort of modular and pertain to a different part of the functionality of a package. Okay, you can also create your own packages. That's sort of more, more extensive and more time than we have here. But um, one of the reasons to create a package is it allows you to sort of share your code with a collaborator really easily. That if you create the package, you can just then um, send them the, the package as one file and they can install it with one line of, of with, a, with a one line command in R and then they have access to the, all of the functionality that, that you had on your computer. Um, and it's also a good way to make what you do reproducible and to share your work. You know, if you come up with a particular uh, approach to doing things, you can share your code, obviously, with the outside world. Um, so I'm not going to say more about that other than that it's um, something that's not too hard to do. And then I just wanted to, um, this goes to the question of the woman over here about, you know, are there good packages and bad packages or not. Um, that's sometimes hard to get a sense for. Um, but if you did, if you were looking for help online with R, then sometimes you'll be able to get a sense for what kind of packages, which packages people are using a lot. So there are mailing lists for R, um, and there are archives of those that you can search, and that link here um, will tell you that. There's, there's lots of, particularly recently, there's been lots of um, activity on this website called Stack Overflow where people post questions 
for sort of general, lots of questions about more than just R type questions, uh, more you know, computing questions in general, but there are lots of R questions that show up on Stack Overflow. And there are some particular mailing lists that are associated with particular aspects of R, like there's, and these are called special interest groups. There's one for doing high performance computing, basically parallel processing. There's one if you're operating, if you're doing, working with R on a Mac, things like that. Um, and just some thoughts here of how, how you can um, optimize, tune your, your Google searches. Because the other thing is you can just do a Google search and you'll often get back results from these various websites. Um, and for here, putting things in double quotes in Google, if you want to do the, have it exactly match what the, 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 the character strings that, you are do, that you're searching for, um, can sometimes be quite helpful. Particularly if you have an error message, you put in double quotes, it'll try and find that exact error message. Um, and you can also post your own questions. Um, the one thing I'll warn you about here, and this is uh, something I think is unfortunate, is that um, the, you, if, you, if you don't do your ho some homework in advance on your question, you may get back a response that's not very friendly. Um, some of the people who uh, post a lot on the, in response to questions are, are experts and developers who um, are, not, are sometimes a little bit crotchety. Um, <laughs> so, I tend to use the mailing lists mainly to search and find that other people have already posted that question. But if I do post, I generally will try and do my homework, look through the documentation, make sure that, uh, look through the other people's postings, make sure that this is, does seem to be something that other people haven't already um, answered or, or posted. Um, and there are some guidelines for, for going about and posting questions on the mailing lists here. On that note, could I just add that I've done this before and I get intimidated by seeing the mean responses. And so Time, Wait, you get intimidated by what? I got intimidated by looking at the responses they received. So when I couldn't find my answer, I emailed the package developer directly, Ben Boker, and it turned out it was a package error, and he fixed it within 24 hours. Yeah, so that... It's really nice sometimes just to contact them. Right, so yeah, if, you, if it, that, that, that's, that's not a bad thing to do. Sometimes they'll, they'll then, they, they might say, oh, please post to a mailing list, but sometimes they'll respond directly. Um, and yeah, I mean, oftentimes people will respond, and if you found an error, then they'll go correct it. So it, there is a community here of people, and it's not like all of the people on the website are, are all of the people responding to the mailing list questions are crotchety, but a few of them are. So occasionally you'll get some one of them responding and being crotchety. So try and uh, try and let it roll off your back and not be too affected by it. Um, on the plus side, the good thing, the thing that that does mean is that essentially the people responding to these mailing list questions are the people who know the most about R literally in the world. Um, and oftentimes it's the package developers who develop a particular package or people who are involved at the, in the core development of R. So they're really knowledgeable and that's, that's really the plus side of this. Okay, so there's not a breakout associated with this. That was just a quick um, thing about packages. Any, any questions or confusion about uh, packages that uh, have come up uh, during the last day and a half? Okay, so let's move on to... Um, Module 10, which is meant to be sort of a tour of some of the advanced features of R and some of the some of the things that can be useful and some of the things that you run into. So let me just do lo my loading in as the preparatory step. Okay, so I say here I sort of extended the teaching people how to fish analogy. <laughs> um, that you're, I'm not going to give you a huge amount of detail here, but hopefully I can tell you that um, you know what some of these things are a little bit about how to use them and how, where you might get uh, more information about this. So a little bit about object-oriented programming in R. It's kind of confusing. It's not nearly as elegant or powerful as things like uh, Python and, or Java. Um, but it can, in, in many cases, do what you need uh, to do, have it do what you need done. Um, so, there, so part of the confusing thing is there are three different ways of dealing with object-oriented programming in R. There's something called S3, which is sort of the old style way of doing things. There's something called S4, which is more sort of for, formalized and is, and is somewhat more recent. And then there's something really new called reference classes that allow you to pass objects around and operate them by reference, on them by reference rather than by value, so that you're not doing a lot of copying of, of big objects. Um, and, that's, and that's a new thing. So the basic idea of object-oriented programming is that, I think I may have said this before, is that when you're writing your code, you structure your coding around objects. And every object belongs to a particular class. And then classes have methods associated with them. So like we saw, the um, LM class has particular methods associated with doing linear regression. The GLM class has particular methods associated with doing GLMs. I think we saw like a date class. The date class has particular methods associated work with working with calendars and dates and times and things like that. 
Um, and, and there are these generic methods like summary and print and predict um, that then there are specific cases of those that are used for particular kinds of objects for particular classes. So objects have what we uh, can call fields, which are basically sort of the components of the object. Um, and we'll see uh, just some basic examples of this. So I forget exactly why I needed this methods package, but apparently I did for some reason. So I'm going to fit both a linear model and a GLM um, here. So mod1 and mod2 are a linear model and a generalized linear model. And I can access the residuals just with this list-like syntax, but in this case, the object is built on a list. It's one of these LM objects, or in this case, the GLM object. And we can see that mod2 is a GLM object, but it's also an LM object. And this is this idea of inheritance that occurs with object-oriented programming, that a GLM object is built upon an, an LM object, but it's sort of, it's got some additional features and some tweaks to the LM uh, functionality. And if I ask whether mod2, which was that GLM fit, is an LM, it'll say, yeah, it's, a, it's an LM, but it's also, it's also a GLM. If I ask if it's a list, it's also a list. So a lot of these objects are basically at fundamentally their lists, and then there's extra functionality built on top of having it be a list. And I can ask, you know, what are the names of the different um, components of my, of my model object? And you can see it's all the sorts of things that you might expect. Here's a few things that we haven't seen before, but um, allows you to get at sort of this idea of these generic methods and these class-specific methods. I can say, what methods, what functionality is associated with the GLM class? And it'll tell you, you know, you can do things like you can apply an ANOVA function to my GLM object, and that would allow you to do a comparison of models. You can, get, you can apply a confidence interval function that would presumably do something related to confidence intervals and all of these other kinds of um, things related to doing modeling. So these are all the different methods or functions that are associated with the GLM class. The other perspective on looking at this is what are all the different specific kinds of predict functions that I, that I could have? And here we say that, oh, there's a, um, there's a predict associated with doing a low S, and there's a predict associated with doing a, a linear mixed effects model, and there's a predict associated with doing a GAM, which was the generalized additive model that we saw this morning. So this is reinforcing that point I made this morning, that you could think of doing prediction with a lot of different kinds of, of modeling. Uh, I think I already made this point that we can look at the generic function and we can look at the class specific function um, and you, we've already seen that. Okay, so these are not just things that we can use F that other people have created for us. If you wanted to, you can create your own objects and classes and methods. So for example, maybe I want to create a little object that is, tells, has information about this particular workshop that I'm offering. And I could say the class of this object is that it's a workshop. And I've just, this is a very, this is the S3 object-oriented framework. This is a very informal way of doing things that I just sort of on the fly said, oh, you know what? I'm going to call this thing, say that this thing has, has the class workshop. And I didn't need to do a lot of sort of formal definition of anything here. So now if I just print out the, um, the object, you can see it looks, you know, it's just printing out as if it's a list. But at the bottom here, it says it has a class attribute and it's actually this workshop class. And if I say, you know, is that object in the workshop class, it'll say, yeah, it is. And if I want to pull out a piece of the object, I can just pull it out as if it's a list. But the other thing I can do, and this gets at some functionality that's sort of hidden behind the scenes in R, but is, is useful to know about and is actually going to tie back in with ggplot2 a little bit, is I can create my own specific method for my specific class. So I could create, you know, as we've seen, I could create a predict.workshop if that made sense, or I could create a summary.workshop class-specific method for my workshop class. Those may, might not make a lot of sense, but, but having a specific print method associated with my class does, might make some sense. So, um, so what does this do? So I, there, there's already a generic print function. I'm going to talk about that a little more in a second. And by putting print dot and then the name of my class, I'm basically creating a, meth, a print method specific to my class, my workshop class. And the, the general way you write this is you have an argument x, that's going to be the, the workshop object that come, that's, that's the input. And then I say here, with that object, I'm going to make a little print, make a little, use the cat function to print out some information about my object in a nice user-friendly format. 
So I'm going to print out the month and the year of the workshop and how many people attended and who the instructor was. I'm going to use that invisible return function that uh, Jacob talked about briefly. Okay, so now if I type just the name of my object, remember before it printed out as a list, it just showed me the dollar sign and the different components or fields of the, of the, of the object. Now if I type the name of the object, it says, oh, it, it does it in this nice user-friendly format. It says, oh, this was a workshop, it was held in whenever, et cetera, et cetera. So this goes to the point that what is happening behind the scenes in R, when you type the name of an object, is it's actually calling the print function on that object. And by default, if there's no specific print function associated with that kind of object, it'll just sort of print it out in an unformatted way. But if there is a specific print function associated with that kind of object, it'll call that specific print function and it'll, it'll do this whatever special stuff is defined in that print function. Um, yeah, question? And if I now want to see it, is it like before, is it like a um, That's a good question. I'm not sure off the top of my head how to do that. Uh, I don't think this is quite what I mean to do. Yeah, that's not sort of quite it. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. That's a really good question. If we can just now, if we can print it out in its sort of unformatted state. Um, Yeah, so you'd run into problems, and that's sort of the, the, the core of the issue with this S3 system being very informal, is that it can break in those sorts of ways. So it would probably throw an error when you type it into Yeah, it would probably throw an error where, it's, where it was, you know, suppose you, def you defined an object and you said it was of the workshop class, and you didn't give it a year, it's going to then throw an error when it tries to do this, this operation here. So let's actually... Um, What's the best? Let me see how, how I want to say this. Um, so I basically already sort of answered this question of what's going on behind the scenes that we're calling a, that when we say, when you give it, the, when we just enter the name of an object, it then goes behind the scenes, it calls the print function, it looks to see if, it then looks at the kind of object it is, looks to see if there's a print function associated with that class of object, and if there is, it uses that print function. Otherwise, it uses sort of a default print function. So that raises the, the question of, remember if we go back to um, what Chris was doing in ggplot, there's sort of a, a subtlety here that, that, we didn't, that didn't come up at that point. Um, but if you look at a line of code like this, you know, he's got the output of ggplot, the ggplot function, and then he does plus, and then he's got this other function, geomline, right? So, if we do 3 plus 7, we know what that does, right? It adds together 3 and 7. There's basically what's called overloading going on here, where there's some, function, some functions defined behind, defined behind the scenes that allow you to say one ggplot object plus another ggplot object, and that gives you back a meaningful ggplot object. So we can define different functionality for the plus function depending on what the inputs to the, 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 to the addition are. And so presumably what's going on here is when I do one, one of the function calls plus another one, each one of them creates a, a type of ggplot object, and then there's a function behind the scenes that knows what to do and what it means to add the two of them together. Okay. So now my question to you is, okay, now that we've added the two of them together, now what happens that causes the result of this line of code to be a plot being created? Uh-huh. So, right, so that, that's certainly true. I sort of meant at a higher level um, than, than quite that. So what, where do you think that code, that code that does each of the little pieces, where do you think that resides? In the libraries. Okay, so it's in the package somewhere. And what happens when we, presumably what happens given what I just said a minute or two ago, after we add these two together, and then R is given the resulting object that's the addition of the two objects, what do you think happens then? Yeah. 
Uh, not quite. I think what's happening here is it's literally running this function here and getting the result. And then separately it's running this function here and getting the result. So now I have two objects. It's adding them together in whatever, in whatever sense ggplot has defined as addition of two ggplot objects. Okay. And now I've got a single ggplot object. And if we do um, you know, r norm of 5 plus r norm of 5, what does that do? Well, it, it creates a vector of 5 long, adds it, adds it with another vector that's 5 long, creates a single vector, and then what happens? That object then gets sent off to the print function, and it then gets printed to the screen based on whatever print function is defined for vectors. Well, presumably that's the same thing that's happening here. There must be a print function in ggplot that when you just give it the name of a, of a ggplot object, we know that the print function then gets called whenever we just, whenever we just tell, give r an object. And so it must be doing print, something like print.ggplot of the ggplot object, and that print function must be the one that somehow does, executes the machinery of actually making the, the, the plot or calling subsequent other functions that will actually do the creation of the plot. So this isn't magic. This is all, this is all using sort of functionality um, behind the scenes that conforms to um, the same sorts of things like when you do 3 plus 7, but in a much, at a much sort of higher level of abstraction. Question? If you, um, if you tried to add it to something else, would you try to cast it as a plot first? Yeah, that's interesting. Like, what if we, I'm not sure if I, um, I'm not sure I have the data in here to be able to, I guess I could, it'd be fun to try that. So, okay, I should be able to execute this. Actually, I need to execute this whole thing, I think, to be able to run Chris's code. Um, so where was I? Uh, next. OK, so let's try and run this. OK, good, so it created a plot. So your, your question is, what if we uh, add something nonsensical to this? Right. So that's basically what I'm trying to do here. I'm trying to add together two things that are like objects with a third thing that's not a like object. And we can see what it happens. Ah, it has a pretty good error message, right? He, he anticipated this problem. <laughs> but you can see what it's doing. He's got this idea of adding things to a plot, adding layers. And it got to the three. It tried to add the three as a layer. And it didn't make any sense anymore. Um, but it, yeah, it's kind of fun to play around with these things and see what happens. Sometimes you'll get these error messages. Sometimes you'll get an inscrutable error message and you're like, that didn't make a lot of sense. Sometimes the, the developers of the code will have, have anticipated this. And other times it'll do some casting behind the scenes or coercion of the types behind the scenes and it might actually do something sensible. So. Okay, so where was I here? Um... Okay, so that was this idea that underlying any time you just type in an object either as the name of an object or as the result of um, a function call that, that, that passes back an object that there's a print going on behind the scenes. Okay, so S4 classes, again, I'm not going to say a huge amount about this. S4, you have to sort of define it more formally. And Jacob's question about could I define my another uh, workshop object that might have different fields in it, that wouldn't be possible with these S4 classes because those have a formal definition of what the fields or components have to be in the object, if the object is in that class. Um, so they're a little bit more difficult to work with because you have to sort of follow all the rules, um, but, but those things um, help you avoid errors. Question. Yeah? Sometimes I can plot a model from the GLM model to that output. If I try and do that on a GLM, then that'll be four packages, but if I try and do it on a GLM, then it'll be three packages. I haven't tried to do plotting with mixed effects model output. Um, right. I mean, you might do what you might do is sort of going back to what I had up here about doing 
I think it was methods. Was that what I had? Um, so I did methods of predict here. You might, or no, let's see. I did methods of class equals gem. You might do methods of class equals LME4 or whatever the class is and see what are the methods. And there might be something that does plotting, but it's not called plot, for example. Um, the th if you've got an S, if you have an object that's an, in the, in a, that's an S4 class, that's in, that's one, that's an S4 object, you need to use at instead of dollar sign to get at the components of the object. Um, so here's an example. LME4 fits mixed effects models, which has random effects as well as uh, fixed effects for those of you who, for whom those, that terminology makes sense. Um, and I can fit one of these mixed effects models where I have basically a random effect. Um, this is probably a random slope by over time, days for each subject in this study, something like that. And if I say, what's the class of the result of this model fit? It says it's an MER, which presumably means mixed effects something. That's the class of it. It's from the LME4 package. And if I say, what are the methods associated with objects that have that class? I can see there, there are a few things I can do with those kinds of objects. And the other thing I can do, and this is, this is a useful command to know because otherwise, if I just type FM1, it's just going to show me the result of printing out that object. So it'll show me maybe some nicely formatted results for a random effects model, so that could be useful to me. But I don't know what are the different pieces within the object that, I might, that might be useful to me. So a way to do that with these S4 classes is say, what are the slot names? These fields are called slots, and if I say slot names, it'll tell me, oh, the pieces in the, the components in this S4 object are there's an ENV, there's an LL, NL model, there's a frame, there's a call. Some of these things might make sense to you just from if you know what a mixed effects model is and you know what some of these terms mean, and that will give you some idea of um, what you might want to pull out from the object. So here's my unsuccessful attempt to try and pull out the random effect component, except that I use the dollar sign, which is what's used for lists and S3 objects, and what I should have used was the at, which is used for S4, uh, components of an S4 object. Is there a reason for that change? Um, I don't know. It might have been the S4 people saying, you know, we want to really formalize things and distinguish ourselves from this old way of doing things, and we're going to use a different operator to do that, but I'm, I'm not sure offhand. Huh? It is, it is a little annoying, I agree. Other questions or comments? Okay, so there are these new things called reference classes. If you're interested in them, you can uh, do a help on, on reference classes. They're sort of like S4 classes, um, but they basically, if you pass an object into, if you have an S, if you have an object that's one, that's, uh, has one of the, that's um, an object of one of these reference classes, you can pass it around into methods that operate on it, and you can modify the pieces in there and they get modified without having to pass back the result um, into a new object. So this is called pass by reference for those of you who've done a little bit of programming. Excuse me. Um, and that's, I don't want to say anything more about it just because we don't have time, but um, just so you know, you're, if, you, if that's something that interests you, you can go and look up some information about that. So let me, let's look a little bit about at error messages and warning messages and dealing with errors in your code, and that can be uh, quite helpful both to understand when you're just running code to do analyses, but also if you're writing your own functions and writing code that you might give to somebody else. So the idea is you generally want to be, as, as much as possible, you want to check for possible errors that could occur and give the user uh, an informative message of what the error was. And as we've seen, it's also useful to warn a user if you're doing something behind the scenes that they might not expect. Um, so that was the case. We've seen these warning messages at various times before. It's like, like when we did the recycling, but we had a 10 vector and then we were recycling a, a three vector into it and it was not, um, divis the 10 was not divisible by 3, it gave a warning message. So the functions that R is using to do that are stop, that gives an error message and stops the execution of the R code, and warning, which doesn't stop the execution but does print out a warning to the user. And we can use those as, as, as users of R as well. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to define my own square root function. Um, and what I'm going to do is, is I'm just going to try and anticipate a few different possible uses of this of, of, my, of the square root function. So I'm going to say, okay, if it's a list, if some of the if the push gives me a list, I'm going to convert it to a convert it to a vector. Hopefully, this will actually work and then give me something that I can work with meaningfully in terms of square of square root. But I'm going to I'm, if I do that conversion, I'm going to print out a warning that says, you know what, that's you gave me a list. I'm converting it behind the scenes just so you know. 
So then I convert x to something that uh, should be a vector using this onList function. And then I proceed onwards and say, if x is not numeric, in which case it wouldn't make sense to take the square root, I give an, I give an error message and I say stop the execution. So I tried to, do, to give a little bit of a funny warning uh, error message, but that's, that's the, warning mes the error message that I have. Um, and then I say, okay, if it, if it is numeric, so here's the not is numeric, and this is the part where it is numeric, then I, then I say, well, what if any of the values in the vector x, so you notice I wrote my code here to operate so that it can work with x being a vector and not just a scalar. If any of them are less than zero, I'm also going to print out a warning that there are negative values in here, and I'm going I'm to go ahead and do the best I can, but I'm going to warn the user. So then I say, okay, for all the x's bigger than zero, I take their square root by uh, raising it to the one-half power. For the other ones, I assign an NAN, and then I return um, x, and then if, if, if none of them were less than zero, I just go ahead directly and do the, do the square root by raising it to the half power. So you can see I've built in some error catching, and I've built in some warnings, and I've tried to anticipate some of the things that I might want to do in the square root function. So this is, of course, a little bit silly because there is a square root function in R that already does most of this. But this is how, if I were you know, writing R from scratch, this is how I might write you know, the square root function. So now if I do my square root, which I didn't load in yet, so it doesn't do anything. Um, OK, so now if I do my square root, you can see it gives back the right answer. If I do my square root with a negative number, it gives back my particular warning message, which was I found some negative values. If I do my square root on character vectors, it gives me back my um, attempt to be funny and say, what's the square root of Bob? Um, if I give it back a list, sort of interesting to see what happens here. Oops. Uh, where was I here? So I give it back a list. You notice it gives an error. It says, what's the square root of Bob? But it also gives the warning message that comes from having initially done that conversion from a list to a vector. So first it tried to do, it, first it did the conversion from a list to a vector and gave out the warning. Then, it, it, then with the resulting vector, it tried to do the square root, but then it found something that was not a number, and that it, then it gave the error message with, uh, about Bob. Um, the reason the warning message comes after the error is that R sometimes will often sort of save the warning messages till the end of the execution and then print them out. So that's why the ordering seems a little bit screwy here. And you'll notice that when I actually use the R square root function, it, does, it gives very similar warning messages to the ones that I put into my square root message. It didn't, it wasn't, it's not quite as funny as I am, but um, <laughs> it, uh, you know, it just says non-numeric argument to mathematical function, which, which is pretty boring, I think. Um, and R, in this case, chose not to be able to handle lists. So if I tried to do a square root of a list, well, that's interesting, it says non-numeric argument. That seems like a not quite the right error message. Um, but it, did, it doesn't handle lists in the way that I tried to build into my function. OK, questions about errors and warning messages? OK, so the next thing that I wanted to go over was, was dealing with what's called catching errors. Um, and this comes up in a lot of different programming languages. There's functionality for doing this. So the basic idea is if I'm automating a bunch of processing, a bunch of analyses, that sometimes in some piece of the analysis, there'll be an error. But if the pieces of the analysis are sort of distinct from each other, then I might not want to have all, the, all of my code stop um, just because there's one error in one piece of it. So suppose I'm fitting, like in the stratified analyses, suppose I'm fitting a linear regression to all each separately to each of the different states in the voter data set. And suppose in one of the states, um, there's no data on income for any of the people. So there's an error that gets created because I can't actually fit my regression for the state of Wyoming. I didn't, I didn't get very many people sampled and none of them wanted to tell me their income. Um, in that case, I'd like to still go on and do the analysis on the other states, even if Wyoming was the third state that was being analyzed. I don't want, I don't want, my, I don't want the processing of California and of Massachusetts to, to not happen because of the error in Wyoming. So the idea is you want to catch errors that happen and, and don't have R fail um, sort of catastrophically. And this, this becomes pretty important when you're doing big analyses, particularly when you're doing sequential stuff or stratified kinds of analyses. So the function you want to use is a function called try, and it's part of this paradigm of something called tr try-catch um, functionality. Okay, so here um, 
I'm going to, instead of using apply or apply or something like that, just for the sake of illustration here, I'm going to use a for loop. And I'm going to try and do um, a bunch of individual regressions of earnings on height stratified by the different education levels. So this goes back to that data set of, uh, that has earnings and height and education in it. And we're going to see what happens when I do this for loop. So notice that uh, in the for loop, this in the uh, tabbing is sort of messed up here. The first thing I do is I print out the education level. So we can see, sort of track what's going on here. So I execute this line of, the, I execute the for loop here. It prints out the 12, so that's the first um, oh, this is a different error than uh, did equals sub. So what is going on there? Oh, it's supposed to be illustrated. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, that, that's actually not a bad thing to happen. Um, so remember I had overwritten, or quote unquote overwritten the LM function with my own silly LM function, and then I'd said, oh, you could access it with stats double colon LM. Well, the LM function that was in the global workspace is still the silly one, um, and so when it then tried to execute this line of code, it wasn't, um, it wasn't able to run my LM function with, the, with a data argument because my LM function isn't actually a real useful function. So I need to get rid of my LM function. I can just remove it. And now you'll notice that behind the scenes, the usual LM function is still there. So this is the same. This is the, the usual LM function that we're used to working with. Okay, so now this should uh, run. Let me redo the whole pipeline here. Okay, so it went through. It did the regression for the education level of 12. That was fine. It then went through. It, it, it got, did the subset to the education level of 16. It did that regression. It got to the, the education level of 99, and it errored out with this particular error message. So this is an example of, of where I haven't caught the error, and all of a sudden it fails catastrophically because one piece of my analysis is broken. So a couple of questions here in terms of inter interpreting what happened. Why do you think that it's, it, it did education level 12, and then education level 16, and then education level 17? Why does it seem like it's out of order? Hmm? Okay, so there's an issue with maybe with sorting. What? So what's where does the where do you think the ordering comes from? So what kind of variable do you think ed level is? So it's it's probably a factor. We could go in and check. And we've already seen that the ordering of factor variables isn't necessarily the ordering that, they, that we would want. So probably what's happening here is that ed level is a factor. R, at some point or another, when it read data in, decided to put them in this order. So that's the order that it's going through and processing them in. Um, so let's see. Class of earnings ed. Oh, uh. Huh, that's interesting. So yeah, I guess we'd have to see what's this. Oh, I see. I, I think I wasn't quite catching what you were saying. I didn't actually look at my own code carefully enough. Oh, okay. So it looks like, yeah, so actually I guess it's not a factor level thing. You were, you were, you were right when, in what you said. It looks like unique is not doing sorting. It's not doing any sorting. And so unique is just producing them in, these, in, the, in this ordering. So often, so oftentimes when you get a weird ordering, it's because of factors. But in this case, I was wrong. It was that uh, it's because of what's going on with unique. Okay, so the, 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 but the core of this example was this idea that it errored out after only doing some of the analysis. Right? Um, so the way to avoid that is this try function. So the basic idea is that you wrap this try function around whatever code you think might fail. And so whenever you fit a statistical model, that's a good place to use the try function because, or an optimization because those will often fail in one way or another. So all I've done here is instead of directly doing that LM, I've done that LM here, 
but it's inside this try function. And I've, then I've returned the result to this temp variable. And then my next step is to say, is the object temp, does it have the class try error? So if there were an error in running LM, what try will do is it'll sort of catch the error and not have R panic. And it'll, it'll create an object temp that has the class try error. And if there's no error, then temp will just be whatever the result of LM should be or would be. So I say if temp is, a, is, a, is of the class try error, then the, then the result of running this code should be that I assign an NA to, my, to the element of this mod list, this list that is storing the results of the regressions for each of the levels. And otherwise, just assign in the result of temp, which should be my linear regression output. So now if I run this code, it should um, deal with the errors more gracefully. So what you can see here oops, is it worked through it, got to 99, it did print the error message, but it kept going and it, it ran the code for the ed level of 14, education level 14 and 11 and 10. There was an error with 98, but it was able to keep going, 7, 2, and then there was an error with 2, and then it was able to run 3 without an error. So now if I went in and looked at mod, the third element of this mod list, that's a legitimate regression output because 3 actually completed successfully, but if I look at the second one, you'll notice 2 was followed by an error here. That's just an NA. So I was able to catch the issues with the, with the errors happening. So any questions about that? Yeah. So um, I've noticed, at least not, when you're not in a loop, if it, you have a script that is running and it runs in an error, it will say error and then jump over it to try to run the rest of your script, which is often kind of not what you want because you actually need to fix the errors. So right. That is a good question, and that's, as, as you mentioned it, it's something that frustrates me often, and I've never thought to think, oh, maybe there's a way around it, uh, which is, which is, a, is an, uh, might, might be, maybe should have been an obvious thing for me to think of. Um, I don't know off the top of my head. Do any of the, any other counselors have run across this or know offhand? Well, I think if you actually put it in a script and run it as a script with source in R, Oh, that's a good point, right. It'll actually stop on errors. Right, 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 right. Yeah, let me, let me expand upon that a little bit. If you, if you have a whole file of R code and you, for example, use the source function to read all of that in, what should happen is it will stop at the point where it has the error. Um, I, th I think that's right. Um, or if you're running in batch mode and you use R command batch, which we'll see in a little bit, to run in the background a whole R job, it'll stop wherever there's an error and it won't keep going. But what happens when we're using R Studio when we're cutting and pasting a block of code in is, is that R is executing the code line by line. It gets to the one that, that ran the error, that caused the error. It spits back, oh, there was an error. But then it's still getting stuff from the terminal input. And so it's, it's as if I did the following. Um, it's as if I did this. That's an error. But now I can do this. Right? That's a legitimate thing to do. I can, I can proceed on manu manually myself and do something after there's an error. And so if I'm just cutting and pasting stuff, that's, that's how R is treating that. It's just like, oh, you gave me the next thing and I, I'm, trying to op I'm trying to process that. Other questions? Okay, so then I wanted to say a little bit about this thing called computing on the language. Uh, this gets, can get to be a little bit esoteric, but uh, can sometimes be useful. So the idea is that you can use R to actually write R code and then execute that R code. Um, and so we need to understand a little bit about what R is doing when it processes the code that you send it to evaluate. So it's basically um, parsing it and, and trying to understand, you know, we've got lots of cases where we have a function called on, on the result of another function and inside that is another function and it's very complicated. And so it basically creates a tree of commands and it, and it then knows how to process its way up through the tree to then process the entire set of commands. And that's called parsing. Um, and so we can actually capture code before it gets evaluated. So usually if we said n gets 100, like here, it would just do the processing and it would uh, create n and put 100 in it. But we can actually, actually capture the code as unevaluated code if we use this quote function. And if I ask what the class of code is, it, say, it says it's, oh, it's, an, it's an assignment object. So it's doing some assignment. And if I, well, n already exists here, but you notice n is not 100, even though I 
even though I tried to say n was 100 here, because it's, it's getting captured before it gets evaluated. So instead, if I say evaluate the code, now if I look at n, it's now indeed 100. So I can sort of um, mess with, with the code directly. Um, and I can do this with more complicated code. So I can, for example, put the quote around a for loop. And now I'm going to say, now more code has all of that whole entire for loop in it. And if I want to see what it sort of looks like, I'm, I can do as.list on the code object. And it'll show that um, the way that R has parsed this to try and interpret it and then be able to evaluate it is that it's a for operation. These are the arguments to the for operation. The index variable is i. It's going to iterate over 1 through n. And the code that it's going to, that it's going to execute at each iteration is this code in the body of the for loop. So R is doing, is sort of processing all of that behind the scenes. And I, and I could actually create code on the fly from character strings. So I could say, paste together the character n, the assignment operator just as characters, and a number, 200, that's going to get coerced to be a character string as well. And now I could say, well, what's code text? Well, code text is just text that contains something that looks like R code. And now I can parse that. And now R is going to treat that as an, as an actual R expression. And then I could actually evaluate that code. And now N is going to be 200. So I can basically create R code on the fly and evaluate it um, as well. And this can, this, I actually don't have a good use case as an example off the top of my head. But this, this can, be, um, can be pretty helpful occasionally. So a couple of cases where that sort of comes in handy to one degree is you might want to automatically operate on, um, suppose somebody gave you a bunch of R objects that were named x1, x2, x3, up to x10,000 or something. You're like, gee, that's really un unhelpful. I can't really, manu I can't really automatically work through all of those objects very easily. I'd have to type in x1, type in x2, type in x3. Um, so just assume that somebody came along and gave you these objects um, where each one of them was named individually. And now I want to work through them. And let's, we're, there are only three here, but assume that there were 10,000 of them or something like that. So I can do something like this. Suppose I want to, um, suppose I want to take the mean of x1, I want to get the mean of x2, and I want to get the mean of x3. But I don't want to have to type in mean of x1, mean of x2, mean of x3. So I can do this. I can say there are three of these objects that I want to iterate over. And in the for loop, I'm going to create a variable name by pasting together x with the number 1, the number 2, or the number 3 by looping over i as my index variable. And then I can use the eval function to say, treat that var name, which is just a character string, treat it as the name of an object. And once I do eval that thing as the name of an object, temp is now going to hold either R norm of, the result of R norm of 5, or it's going to hold whatever was in x1, or whatever was in x2, or whatever was in x3. And then I can just say mean of temp, and that's going to compute the mean of each of these things. So if I do that, um, this is indeed the mean of those of x1, x2, and x3 concatenated together. Var name as of the last iteration of this loop is this x3, where I pasted together x with the last value of i which in this case is 3. Temp is whatever was in x3. That's the result of doing this eval of as name. So that's going to be our unif the, the 20 uniform values. Um, and that, yeah, so that's how to do it. And the other thing I can do um, is I could actually create, I could be the one who created the 10,000 values, x1, x2, x3, x4, those 10,000 objects. I could have done that automatically. And the way that I can do that is I can do something like this. I can say var name is, and then have a character string that's the name of the variable that I want to create. So this would be x1, x2, x3, once I paste in i one at a time. And then I can say assign to that variable name whatever object, whatever object I want or, or values I want to assign to it. So this is basically um, So if I do this, this is now going to have created x1 is 10 random normals, x2 is 10 random normals, x3 is 10 random normals. And var name was x1, and then it was x2, and then it was x3. 
and then the assignment does the assignment into an object whose name is created based on that text string. So that's another way of autom sort of automatically manipulating uh, names of objects. So I don't know if any of you, as you're, as you're hearing this, if there are any ways that you can think of this might be useful um, in what you do. Does anything occur to anybody? Yeah? You could use it kind of instead of shell scripting, like write to a bunch of files or something. Okay, so that would be one way of sort of working with character strings. That's more sort of, I would say that's more sort of um, yeah, processing of text strings and then creating files. I'm not, sorry, I'm not sure, that's, that is very useful. It's not quite in the way here of creating R code, but it's certainly quite useful. Other things that you could do? Um, the other thing that occurred to me as I was thinking about it um, when I was creating this is that sometimes if I'm creating the formula for a, like a linear model, I want to say, you know, first I want to I want to regress, regress on x1 plus x2 plus x3, and then I want to add in x4, and then I want to add in x5, um, and so I want to create a formula. You know, we've seen formulas like y tilde x1 plus x2, but I've had to sort of type all that in. So if I wanted to sort of uh, automate that process of creating these formulas, you can do that by creating these tech, these strings where I literally would paste together, you know, quote y tilde x1 plus x2 plus x3 by using functions like paste and these other string operations. And then I can do something like as.formula. And it's going to now create something that you can see it doesn't have quotes around. That sort of indicates that it's treating it as something that's not a character string. And you could literally do lm oops, of as.formula of, you know, the stuff above here. And that should work. Okay. So that's, that's, that's one thing that sometimes comes up if you're, if you're automating stuff. So then I just had a few more things that sometimes come up in reading data into R. Um, actually, I'm sort of reading, working with files more generally. So let me, um, let me just hit the highlights of those. So let me, let me go to the slides here. Um, uh, can somebody, was it, oh, was it advanced, I think it was called? Yeah. Okay, so this, there's this idea of file encodings. And basically this is dealing with the fact that we might have characters coming to us from other languages other than English. Um, or other kinds of symbols that are that are um, that we might be able to print out and work with on a computer. So basically, ASCII is sort of the the most basic set of characters. There are 128 of them. If we look on Wikipedia, it'll tell us what the 128 are somewhere down here. Um, so it tells us that the the 128 ASCII characters are composed of some control characters, things like something that stands in for a, a return. Something that stands in that that's that's um, denoted in sort of plain text as slash n. There's one for doing um, tabs, so horizontal tabs slash t. So there's there's an ASCII character that corresponds to each of these different control characters. Backspace. There's a, a character for doing a bell. This comes from sort of the old days of computing. Um, and then there are the actual printable characters in ASCII that are things like uh, punctuation, and then the actual lower and uppercase letters of the standard 26 letters of the, of the, uh, of the alphabet. Um, but that's all that we can work with if we're working with ASCII. We can't put, you know, accents on letters from European languages. We can't work with um, characters from Chinese or from Korean. Um, so there's lots of other ways. There's lots of other encodings of other sets of characters that aren't just um, the 128 ASCII. But if we are working with other character sets, we need to have R, or more generally the computer, sort of recognize what kinds of characters we're working with. And so these are these things that are called encodings. There's an encoding called UTF-8 that's an encoding for what are called the Unicode characters, and this includes basically all the characters from essentially all of the languages that are commonly used in the world. Um, and then there's sort of a subset of these Unicode characters that, that, that it, uh, comprises something called the Latin 1 encoding. And that's basically going to include standard English. Um, what's the name of our alphabet? That's, that's not a trick question. Huh? Yeah, Latin. The Latin alphabet. Um, that includes, you know, those, the, the standard Latin alphabet characters 
plus all of the characters in European languages that have all of the various accents and whatnot. So we can actually deal with the sum in R. I'm going to go back to R Studio to see this. But sometimes what happens is you'll get a text file. Either it's just sort of a file of, of, of text like a document, or it's actually a data file. But within the data file, there's a field that has um, character strings. And those might have European words from European languages or, or other languages in them. And if R doesn't know what, how to handle those encodings, you're going to get errors when you try and read that into R. So this is not sort of comprehensive of how to exactly deal with all of those cases, but just give, give you a hint of how you might start to deal with that. So sometimes you'll see something like this. You'll get a character stream that looks like that. And that looks like some sort of European language, but it's got this funny slash XE7 in the middle of it. And that's basically an encoding for a character that has an accent on it. Um, and so we need to convert, we need to, um, convert that to um, R, I think, is going to be operating natively with um, this UTF-8 encoding. So this encoding with the slash XE7, I think, is Latin 1. So as you, as you might be able to see from sort of as I'm hesitating here, I, this, I don't know a lot about these encodings. I've sort of, I'd sort of know enough to get by. And I'm sort of trying to, to give you a sense of, of how you might uh, know enough to get by as well. But the basic trick is to try and do this conversion from one encoding to another, and then hopefully R will be able to, to recognize it in the encoding it's used to. So if I do this, oops, I didn't um, tell it what text was. OK, so it's giving me this error message back, something about this multi-byte string. So it doesn't know how to handle the XE slash XE7 bit. So if I type in, oops, if I type in text here, it's still just, it, it's able to print it back, but it sort of doesn't really quite know how to handle it. Um, and if I do this conversion, I can convert it to UTF-8. R know how, knows how to handle that encoding, and you can see that it's converted from this, this symbol XE7, which is in base 16. That's what the slash X means. It's converted it and said, oh, you know what? That's just a C with one of the little twiddles on the bottom. There's probably a name for that, but uh, I don't know. Uh, what I guess this is probably Portuguese, maybe. I don't, I don't know what that letter is, but um, but it now, R now knows how to handle it. And I could uh, try and convert from, from Latin 1, which is what this thing originally is, to ASCII. And here is the, an, an argument that says, you know, if you don't recognize something as being an ASCII character, just substitute some question marks in. And so that's what it's doing here, because it didn't know how to recognize the C with the twiddle on it. And you can do other things like this. You can say, you know, if you created a character string that had one of these weird encodings, you could tell it, you know what? Hey, R, the encoding for this should be Latin 1, and you should be able to then be able to process it and work with that. And indeed, once we tell it that that's the encoding it shouldn't use to interpret this, this string here, then it knows how to print it out correctly. So you could do some sort of fun things, like what if I create uh, X as having a bunch of these, uh, in, a bunch of these characters that, it, that are in this Latin 1. I don't actually know what slash X, I don't know what A1, A2, A3, and A4, F1, and F2 are. But if I then tell it the encoding is Latin 1, I could then see what, what symbols get produced like that. Oh, OK. A1 is uh, an upside down exclamation point, and A2 is the cent character, and A3 is the British pound character. So you can sort of see a little bit about what might be going on behind the scenes here. So any questions there? So that's something that comes up some of the time. The other thing that comes up sometimes when you're moving text files from Windows to Unix, or from Unix to Windows, or to a Macintosh, is you can have problems with the line endings in the text files. And so the reason for this is that there's sort of non-standard, there's not standardization across operating systems. So in Windows, if you have a text file and then you have a new line or a carriage return, it uses two characters to indicate that there's a new line. It uses one of these ASCII characters, a slash n, and it uses an ASCII character, this slash r. In Unix, the only thing that it uses is a slash n to indicate the end of a line. Um, and on a, on a Mac, I think it may only use one of these slash r character returns. So what happens is if somebody, if you're working in Linux or Unix and somebody sends you a file that they created in Windows, what you might see in that file if you open it up or read it into R is you might see a, 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 a caret m at the end of each of the lines. And that caret m is left over from the fact that in Windows, there was both a slash n and a slash r at the end of each line. But Unix only interprets the slash n as the end of the line, and it then sort of plugs in a, this caret m as its representation of the slash r. So 
that's a little bit frustrating sometimes. It happens quite a bit. There are these utilities in Unix, um, depending on what flavor of Unix you're using, DOS to Unix and from DOS, that will do the, com the conversion from a Windows format to the Unix format. And I presume that there are ways to do this in reverse if you're working in Windows and you get a file from, um, from Unix. Because what would happen in Unix is the Unix file just has a slash n at the end. You give it to Windows. Windows is expecting a slash n and a slash r. And so Windows then treats it as just not multiple lines of text in the file, but all, all of the lines in one line. So I'm guessing that there are probably utilities in Windows that will do the conversion. I'm not conversant enough in Windows to know what those are. Um, but basically, the main point I want to make here is that if you see this sort of thing happening, this is what's going on. And just that, to give you a sense of what sort of, um, what sort of things you need to go Google to try and figure out how to, how to fix the problem. Yeah. Oh, that explains it. Okay, that makes a lot of sense because I've, yeah, most of the time I don't have this problem that some, when, when I go from Mac to Unix, I don't have the problem that it, it deals weirdly with the lines. But every so often, somebody will come to me with a problem or come to me with a file and it will have a problem and it must be that it's just a really old file. So that, yeah, thanks. That, that explains things. Okay, um, and then the, um, the last thing I wanted to mention before the break is just that, that R can work pretty nicely with databases. So basically a database is just a collection of these um, data, set, data sets in sort of row column format where you have records and fields. Um, and a, data, a relational database is you've got multiple ones of these tables that relate to each other by having fields that are in common between the, the, data, ta the data tables. So that's a good way to store big, uh, big data sets. And R can actually pull data from a database. And what R does is it provides basically a front end package that allows you to query different kinds of databases using the same uh, common syntax. And then there are these back ends that interact with the database, the particular kind of database, and sort of abstract or hide away from the, you the details so that you can just operate with the same syntax in R regardless of whether the back end database is an SQLite database or a MySQL database or an Oracle database or whatever. Um, so the basic way you can uh, do this sort of thing, let me go back to R here. Oh, I guess I'm in R, sorry. <laughs> I thought I was in the uh, spreadsheet. I mean, I thought I was in the, um, the HTML. So there's this database. I'm just using this as an example. This is a database of bibliographic information on statistics journal articles, um, which I happen to have on hand. It's not actually freely available, so I didn't distribute it to you guys. Um, but just to give you an idea of what you can do, I can load, this is a database that's in an SQLite format. So I can load the R SQLite package that does the interfacing between R and SQLite. And then I can do commands like connect to the data, connect via an SQLite interface to the database, which happens to be called cis.db, and it's sitting on my hard drive. And I can say, what are the different tables in the database? Well, there's a table of different articles. There's a ta table of the different auth authors of all the various articles. There's a table of different books that are in the database. And I can say, what are the fields or the columns of the articles database? And it says, oh, you know, each of the articles has information on ID and type and page start, page end, et cetera, et cetera. And I can then do a query, or basically a, um, a selection from the database. So for example, I could from the, this is, this, is, um, this is SQL syntax, which some of you may be familiar with. So this says select um, all the fields from the author's table, the author's data, data set, where the name of the author looks like of the form Bryman, who was a famous statistician who um, worked here at Berkeley. So if I do that, um, it should return to me just the information about this guy named Leo Bryman. And in this case, there's not too much information because this is just information on the authors. It doesn't have any, uh, the information on his articles is in the articles table and not in the authors table. But it gives me the ID associated with all the people whose names uh, include the, the string Bryman. This is presumably the same person. He just got listed twice in the database. OK, so did I not do a, um, 
Okay, so two things about the breakout. One is that it's not really a breakout. Uh, it's, just, it's just a break. Uh, but if you want to uh, have, a little, um, have a little fun, you can look and see if there's a grammatical issue in this particular Dilbert strip. Um, and the other thing is we'd like you to fill out a feedback form for the workshop. And I thought I had in inserted... Huh? Find what? Yeah, so hold on one second. Um, so I thought I had inserted the URL for the for the form for the feedback form in that document, but I don't. I guess I must not have uh, done the git pull that I needed to do. So it should be on GitHub. So if you go to GitHub Berkeley SCF R Bootcamp, and if you go to the README file, I think I probably mentioned this yesterday. The feedback form that we'd like you to fill out is here, um, and if you go to it, it will then go to a bunch of questions that we're hoping that you fill out. Yep. Yeah, I'm going to leave it here. Um, so, yeah, so the break is there's some, there's some food outside, and then uh, please do take the time to fill out the feedback form, and then we'll pick up after the break with the last session. So the URL is go to this website, the GitHub site, and then click on the README file, and then the, the link is in there. Okay, let's go ahead and get started again. Okay, so the, essentially the last substantive um, module is, is on parallel uh, processing. And then I have a few comments sort of concluding remarks. That's uh, module 12, but there's not, not too much in there. So the, the basic idea here is we're not going to get into very particularly advanced parallel processing. I just want to show you Give you, for those of you not too familiar with um, parallel working in, in parallel on a computer, I want to give you a, little, a few of the basics, and then I want to show you a few of the ways that you can do pretty simple parallel processing in R and speed up um, your cal your, any calculations you're doing. Okay, so one note here is I didn't, I'm going to do the demo in just in an R command line session because it, it was doing some weird things with R Studio, and I'm not sure quite what was, what was going on, so just, just a caution there. Um, so let me, uh, I think I'm actually going to open up the slides. Okay, so a little bit about computer architecture. So the basic idea is that most modern computers, laptops, desktops are going to have multiple processors and we want to try and take advantage of having those multiple processors exist on our single computer. And then if we tar start talking about, say, a Linux cluster or some sort of supercomputer, those are going to be machines where th those are going to be systems where you have multiple individual machines or computers or they're often called nodes each one of those machines or nodes has multiple processors, and those are all networked together with a fast network. So the key thing to get more bang for our buck um, when we're doing pretty basic level parallel processing is we want to take the operations that we need to execute and break them up so that they're executed by the different processors. So that's going to be our goal here. So there are basically one, one framework for looking at this is that there are two um, sort of uh, context for doing um, distributed, uh, di just doing, doing parallel processing. One is if you have all the processors on a single machine and they're all sharing the same memory, in which case you don't need to be passing information from one machine to another. All of the, all of this, the stuff you're working with is in memory on the same machine. And that, that, that means you're not doing a lot of, you're not doing communication between the machines. And that's called shared memory computation. And the other is if you've got multiple different machines and you're doing a piece of calculation on one machine and then you're doing a piece of calculation on another machine and if they need to share information then you need to pass the information over the network. And that's called distributed memory computation because the two different machines have two different, have, me have physical memory, they have two different pieces of physical memory and they're not sharing that memory. Yeah, 
I mean, there's, there's, are you talking about like cloud computing and Amazon Web Services and things like that? Yeah, I mean, there's certainly, you can, ba you can basically now with Amazon and some other providers, you can basically start up a whole cluster of multiple nodes. So you can basically start up, I say here that there, there are these clusters in supercomputers that have multiple network machines. Um, with Amazon, you can basically start up a single remote machine or you can start up a network of, of remote machines and basically create your own cluster on the fly. Um, it's rather beyond the, con the scope of what I, what I can have time to talk about here. Uh, yeah, uh, EC, Amazon EC2 is sort of the, of what a lot of people use, and that's uh, part of Amazon Web Services. Um, so we're going to focus on shared memory computation here. The reason is that it's somewhat simpler, and it's also the context that, that is how you can sort of get started with this, is if you're just working on your laptop or your desktop and it has multiple processors, you can very easily farm out your computations to those multiple processors and get your work done faster. There's also, if you ask me afterwards, or I think there's a link on here, I have some um, sort of tutorial information on parallel processing and on cloud computing, um, and you could, you could, you could, that's a segue, an entree point into, into some of that sort of stuff. Okay, so the first thing, if we're just concentrating on shared memory where we have a single machine, such as your laptop or desktop, and, and, it, ha and it has multiple cores, we, need, we want to know a little bit about that, how many cores, we want to know how many cores you have. In Linux, there's a file called slash proc CPU and info, and that'll, that'll list out the different cores, and you can just look and see how many there are. On a Mac, you can run this, com this command in the terminal. Darn it. Um, so here I am on my Mac. I open up a terminal window, which is basically just a Unix shell. In this case, it's a bash shell. And I do this. You run the system profiler um, command, and then I'm just looking for the particular results in that output that have the word cores in them. And if I do that, sort of taking surprisingly long, um, it, it gives me back one of the lines in the result of running the system profiler is there is a line that says total number of cores. So in this case, it says my laptop has two cores. So that gives me some idea of how many different uh, parallel processes I can have running at a given time. So that's, that's the first thing you would need to know. I'm not, there might be, oh, there's a program uh, that you can run uh, for a Windows machine. This is a program <coughs> off the web that will tell you how many, your, how many cores your machine has. The other thing is, I think if you look under Task Manager and Performance, you're going to see separate graphs for each of the cores on a window, Windows machine. So you should be able to just count up those graphs, and hopefully it'll be fairly clear how many of them there are. Um, and the other thing you can do after you're actually running a job and you want to see if that job is, is actually being done in parallel is on a Mac or a Linux machine from the terminal window, you can use a program called TOP or a program called PS that we'll see. Um, or in Windows, you can again do task manager performance and look at CPU usage. And, you sh and that should give you an indication of how much, um, what percentage of the CPU is being used on your machine. And if it, you can see if there are multiple nodes and if they're all being utilized. Okay, so there, there, in R, there are a few different ways of making use of the fact that your machine, uh, if your machine has multiple cores. Uh, so one is just that all of the underlying linear algebra in R is using these packages, these um, system level packages called BLAS and LAPAC that I mentioned yesterday. They're doing the basic linear algebra and doing the linear algebra uh, decomp matrix decompositions. And so some of these linear algebra, some of the BLAS and LAPAC implementations um, will distribute their computations across what are called different threads, which are basically separate processes that are running on the separate cores or processors on your machine. Um, and I'll say a, a little bit more about that in a second on the next slide. The other thing is that if we have what's called an embarrassingly parallel problem, um, then we can basically very easily split up our computations across the different cores on our machine. And what I mean by an embarrassingly parallel problem is um, one where basically the different pieces of the calculation are independent of one another and they don't need to interact. So examples of those are like doing a for loop where the, the different iterations in the for loop are independent of each other, or if you're using apply or, or um, s apply or l apply or something like that um, to, to, to do parallel uh, calculations or to, to, to operate one by one. So um, in terms of the thread linear algebra, I've said a little bit about the default uh, BLAS and default LAPAC on um, most machine that come, that gets installed, that, that comes with R, um, that that's often fairly slow. 
And so some of the ones that are both fast and also have this capability to, to be threaded, which is to execute different pieces of the linear algebra on different cores, um, there are a few of them, a few different ones. There's something called OpenBLAS, there's something called MKL that comes from Intel, and there's something called ACML that comes from AMD. Um, so for those of you who are in the statistics department, we actually have these installed on our, um, on our machines. We have both OpenBLAS and ACML installed, depending on which machine you're working on. And if, if they're properly installed and set up with R, then R is going to use these faster threaded um, linear algebra um, packages. For a Mac, uh, Apple provides something called Veclib, and it's in a, it's in a file called librblast.veclib.dylib. Um, I don't know that there's any capability for Windows, so that might just be a result of my ignorance. Uh, but if you're looking to see how to get, uh, for example, if you have a Mac laptop and you're looking to see how to get to do linear algebra with R in a threaded fashion, you can uh, look on the R documentation for Veclib and, um, and for, for BLOSS and, and get some information about that. Okay, so here's an example of what we're, where we're going to see that my machine here is actually using a threaded BLAST because I've set it up to use this, this Veclib from Apple. This is a, a Mac laptop here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have two terminal windows open. I've got a, I've got a session of R here open just, in my, um, just on, my, on a terminal on my machine here. So I'm just starting R from the command line. So this is basically just, if we go back to R Studio. This is basically just sort of this window of R Studio, and that's all that's all I'm seeing when I just run R from the command line in a terminal window. And what I'm going to do over here is this is I'm just in a Bash shell, um, like what Jared was doing, and I'm going to run this program called Top, and that basically shows me all the processes that are executing on my computer. So it looks like I have R running already. That's probably the set the the R um, that's running as part of R Studio, and then I've got some other sort of system level stuff running. But I'm going to run this, these commands where I create a big 5,000 by 5,000 matrix, and then I'm going to take a cross product of that. That, for those of you who are familiar with it, that produces a positive definite matrix, like a correlation matrix or a covariance matrix. And I can do a matrix decomposition called a Cholesky decomposition if I have a positive definite matrix. These operations are fairly computationally intensive um, when I have a big matrix. So this is going to take a little while. And there's a real advantage to farming out those computations across more than one core because they do indeed take a while, but, because, but they're also fairly easy, it's fairly easy to write an algorithm that does this in parallel. And that's what happens with these, with these linear algebra implementations. So you can see it's taking a little while to operate, and you, often, you can also see that on the line here where it shows that I'm running R, I guess I must have started R before I ran top because this is probably the same R. Um, oh, it finished, so let me, let me do that again to illustrate. If I look at top, you can see under percent CPU, it's above 100%, which seems like a, a funny thing to be doing. But what it's indicating is that I, we already showed you that I have two cores on this machine. And when it, when it goes above 100%, it, in, it indicates that it's using more than one core to do the calculations. So that's a way that you can verify, indeed, that, um, that your calculations are being done in parallel. So that basically comes for free in the sense that if you do have one of these fast and threaded BLAS uh, packages and, and, and similarly for LAPAC, um, you don't have to do anything and R will naturally do parallel computations whenever it's doing linear algebra. So if you happen to do stuff that involves linear algebra, that can be uh, really quite helpful. So any questions about that so far? Okay, so that's, that's one thing you can do. Um, okay, so I have a few details here about um, how you might go about setting this up on your own machine or talking to your systems administrator to get it set up on, on whatever system you're operating on. And there are also some caveats here about there are some, there are some conflicts between this BLOSS, uh, threaded BLOSS linear algebra and some of the stuff I'm going to show you next. Um, so there's, there are some cautions here about that. Um, okay, so what is an embarrassingly parallel problem? So I, I, I sort of already mentioned this essentially, that it's, it's whenever you can um, essentially be doing independent computations as separate processes that don't need to communicate uh, between each other. And so the idea is sort of like map apply for those of you who uh, have heard of that, um, that you're basically taking your original problem, breaking it up into pieces, farming it out into different processes that run on the different cores, and then you're collecting whatever the results are back on your, on, at, your master, at, at the master process. 
So here are some of the things in statistics that we do that um, will generally be embarrassingly parallel. Any sort of stratified analysis, cross-validation, if you're doing simulations where things are independent, bootstrapping, random forests, there's lots of things like this. Um, and you may be able to think of things in you know, the sorts of things that you do. There are also lots of things that are not embarrassingly parallel. So anything that's sequential in nature, such as an optimization where you're moving and trying to find the minimum, for example, or for those of you who do anything with Bayesian models, or if you're doing a markup chain Monte Carlo, um, that's not going to be um, easily. It, some of these things can be parallelized in certain ways, but they, they're not, it, you can't do it very easily, and they're not embarrassingly parallel pro problems. Questions or comments about that? Okay, so I'm going to show you two basic ways of uh, working with embarrassingly parallel problems in R. Um, first of all, if you're going to use for each, it's basically a replacement for a for loop. So you need to make sure that what you're doing in the for loop is actually independent from uh, iteration to iteration and is not a sequential operation. Um, so for each, sort of like I said with the database stuff where I could interact with different kinds of databases on the back end, but there was a common interface for me as the user. That's similar, that's, that's sort of what's going on with this package called for each. So basically, for each is a way for you as the user to have a common way of basically replacing a for loop with a for loop where the, the iterations of the for loop get farmed out to different cores or different processes, but where the back end parallelization varies depending on whether you're working on a single machine or you might be working on a supercomputer or a Linux cluster. You can use for each with any of these, any of the, in any of these contexts as long as you choose the appropriate back end. So for our purposes here, for just doing this on a single machine, we're going to use a backend um, called the, uh, we're going to use the parallel backend that comes in, in something called the do parallel package. And here's the basic syntax. I'll walk through it and then we can actually do the, do the demo. So I need to make sure that parallel is sort of a core R package that does a lot of basic parallel processing type stuff. So I need to make sure that that's, that's, that package is, is loaded in. I think I may have said this before, but you can either load a package with library or with re the require function. There's sort of a subtle difference between them, but uh, not, probably not important to go into here. Um, and, then I need, and then I'm going to load in this do parallel and for each. And so basically, based on this, this front end for each is going to use do parallel as a back end to interact with the different cores on my computer here. Yeah? Why don't you want to run this in our studio? I don't know. It didn't work when I tried it. <laughs> um, <laughs> It, yeah, I mean, it, it, there, I, don't think there, I don't know if there's any particular reason that it shouldn't work, but when I was trying to make these slides by going from the R markdown file and then processing it, process, oh, actually, maybe, yeah, I, the problem is I, I tried this a few different ways, and I'm no, no longer totally clear on what was and what wasn't working, but I think I did try it in our studio, and it didn't work for some reason. I'm not sure why. It's sort of okay because oftentimes when you're doing parallel processing, you're going to be doing it as sort of a background job, and you won't you won't actually be doing it directly. You won't necessarily be directly doing it from our studio. Okay, so I'm gonna, then going to say that I have four cores on my machine. I don't actually have four cores on my machine. I only have two, um, but um, there is there seems like for my machine there's something uh, called hyperthreading going on where it acts as if it has more than two cores. So I'm going to try and to take advantage of that. But in general, what you would do here is you set it to the actual number of physical cores that you discovered by the, via the previous slide. And then I need to do a registration step where I tell, um, where I basically set things up to tell the do parallel package that um, to go out and sort of find the cores and, and, and start to, to do some um, setup so that it can actually access the different cores in my machine. So this test fun is just going to be some, this, this in, in your case would be the fun function that would actually do the body of your work. In this case, it's just a silly function that um, just calculates the mean of a bunch of normal random variables for me, just for the sake of illustration. So the guts of things here is I'm just setting a cup, up a couple of variables that'll um, control some of the settings here. And then I'm going to run basically a for loop, but it's not quite, it doesn't, the syntax looks different than a for loop, and it's one of these for each loops. So you can see there's some information about the iterations. I'm iterating over i from 1 up through n sims, which in this case is going to be 100. So this sort of looks like a for loop, but it, the syntax is a little bit different. This dot combine argument tells, tells for each how to combine the results. So for example, suppose the result of one iteration of this for each loop was a vector, and the result of the second one was a vector, the result of all of them was a vector, then I might combine the results as, as a c-bind into a matrix. Or if the result of each of the individual iterations was just a scalar, I might combine the results by just using the C function to concatenate them into a vector. 
So here I'm explicitly telling 4-H to do the combine as just using C, the C function, to concatenate the results. Oftentimes you don't need to include this argument, it'll just do it by, it'll be sort of smart in how it do, does it by default, but here I'm being explicit about it. And then there's this funny sort of new operator called percent do par that's just in the syntax of for each that basically says farm out this for loop into, on, to my different processes, to my different cores. And then everything in the body of the for loop here, or the for each loop, um, in these four, in, in between this, the squiggly brackets, is what's going to be executed separately on each of the different cores. So in this case, I'm putting in some print statements, um, and I'm doing, I'm running my test fund with i varying depending on what the index of the of the for loop is, and my function is is not really going to do much different, but it's going to behave slightly differently depending on what the value of i is. Um, and then, as the last line, I need to give back the object from the calculation of that iteration. And what for each is going to do is it's going to take all of the out sub results from each of the individual processes, combine them together based on dot combine, and put the result in the object out. So it's doing the, it's handling all of the collection of results. So we can, um, let me just go ahead and copy and paste that into my R session. Hopefully that copying went okay. Um, so here I am back in R. Um, I'm just going to quit out and sort of clean things out. Uh, what happened here? Looks like I might have gotten into my cut-paste buffer more than I expected. So it looks like I ran it, but then I pasted in a bunch of text as well. Um, OK, so let's just look at the piece that looks like it was legitimate code and ran. So. You can see I did the require parallel. I said, I, I said make a, oh, this is different. Sorry, I'm, I'm cutting and pasting something different here. Let me get out of here. Uh, let, me, let me cut and paste from the RStudio text file because that's, um, or from the R markdown file because that's going to be an easier cut and paste. I think I was having trouble with the PDF for the HTML. Okay, so I'm going to cut and paste. I'm not going to run this in our studio. I'm just going to cut and paste into um, into a terminal window. Okay, so now if I run that for each, you can see it's printing out the information. It says starting one, two, three, and fourth jobs, and five, six, seven, eight. So you can see it's sort of going through in chunks, and that's because I've got the four cores set up. It's dispatching four processes, waiting for each of them to come back, and then dispatching another one. And so it's sort of... Um, it's sort of operating in these blocks in some sense, although eventually as they take a little bit different time to finish, it'll look a little bit, it might look a little bit more continuous. Um, so you can see it's just working through and doing all 100, there are 100, process, there are 100 tasks that need to be done. It's doing them on four different cores and it's sort of cycling through and, and using each of the cores to sequentially uh, finish up tasks from this set of 100 tasks. And you can also see in top, I left top open, it looks like it's running four separate R processes. So this might be the master process. These are presumably the four separate worker, worker processes that are handling the four each, because I set it up to, how to use four cores. And if you notice, it looked like each of them was using a little bit more than 50%, even though I only have two cores and presumably could only have a total of 200% CPU usage. And that, I think, is this business of there's some hyper-threading uh, going on that's sort of acting as if it has more than the physical number of cores that are on the machine. As you can see in how I'm talking about it, I don't really understand that, so I can't say too much more about that. So now if I look at, um, at out, out now has the results. These are the first five results from the first five tasks out of the hundred that were dispatched and were done um, via this parallel processing. Okay, so any questions about that? So this is the basic way you could get um, get parallel processing going on your machine, you know, really quickly without a lot of without a lot of work. Um, and you can think about sort of what the advantages and disadvantages are of having breaking up your problem into many large tasks versus have uh, uh, having a few large tasks versus very many small tasks. Sometimes you have control over how big each of the individual tasks is. Um, 
So any thoughts on what, what these advantages and disadvantages might be? Because you can't get what? No. For the standard functions, is there a way to achieve parallelism? Unless you explicitly state this parallel proof R. Um, yeah, most of the standard functions in R, <coughs> unlike, say, in MATLAB, are not parallelized just naturally. So you have to be doing something man more manual like this. Or if you're doing linear algebra. Uh, so any thoughts on advantages and disadvantages? Is it sort of like what you've been saying about for loops in general, where you need to think about how much of the time spent is like the overhead processing of like, doing each task in the post Yeah, that's a pretty good analogy. Were you going to say something similar or something different? Or? Um, I guess it's kind of similar. Like, it seems like if you were doing anything with a big object, you would probably copy it to each core first. Right. Or it would mess something up. Yeah, so those, those are both good points, that if, if, there's, if you have many, many small tasks, a lot of the time is going to be spent up in sort of the overhead of communicating the tasks and getting the results back. So you might not want to break it up into problems that are too small. Um, but if you break it up into really big problems, you might, be, you might have very big objects. Uh, well, I guess in that case, you would want to break it up into fairly... Yeah, you'd have to sort of think about how big the objects are and how many of them you're creating. I, I'm sort of on the fly. I, I don't have a generic... Uh, answer for that, but you, but you would definitely want to think about that. If you break up into a lot of big tasks, one of the dangers is that, you know, suppose you've got four cores in your machine and you just decide to only break it up into four, ta four big tasks. Those tasks might take somewhat different amounts of time, and so there might be some inefficiency in that because maybe the first one finishes in five minutes and the other one takes seven minutes, and then those two minutes you're not using some of the cores. So there are some of these issues of sort of breaking things up in an efficient way. Is there anything kind of like a join style where it'll like break it up until it's like a certain size. I don't know of anything automated like that. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so the other way, another sort of standard and easy way to break up the computations is there are various ways of doing basically a parallel apply. So there's some help that talks about doing all, you know, I said there is a zillion different kinds of applies. And there's some help that talks about parallelizing those various um, applies in general. Um, and then I'm going to go through a couple examples um, where I'm going to parallelize those. Um, let me... Uh, I think I didn't do a git pull to update some of my files. So let me do that, although I thought I did. Um, apparently not. Um, but that document looked a little bit old. Um, so let me reload that and see if I've gotten the newer version. Apparently, okay, I'm not sure what's going on here. This, this looks slightly different than I was hoping it would look, but it's, it's not a big problem. Um, okay, so we can also do parallel applies. Um, let me... Let me show you the first one. So I can I can use again I can use the parallel package. I can I can uh, make a cl may basically make a cluster, tell it that there are how many cores there are, and sort of make a little um, computing cluster out of those. So if I do that, um, again I'm just going to do this in an R regular R window. So now if I do that here, it's sort of taking a little while to set things up, it says, oh, it, I made something called a socket cluster with four nodes on the host local host, which is just my local machine. So sockets are sort of some, some technology that's going on under the hood here that I don't want to get into, but um, it did, it did, it's now set up to do parallel processing. And so, actually, I guess I need my test fund to be loaded into R as well. So that's the same test fund as I had here. So let me load that back into my terminal window because I had closed R in the interim. Um, so what parallel par s-apply is going to do is it's going to do an s-apply 
But as the first argument, I need to tell it the object that sort of holds the information about my little cluster of nodes, of processors. And then, I, and then the rest of this is basically just like doing an s-apply. I'm giving it a sequence of numbers to do the s-apply along, and then I'm giving it a function to apply to those. So if I now do that, um, I can then do that here. Looks like I forgot to say something, set up an argument here, or an, ar an object here. Now if I do that, oh, OK, I also forgot to do that. Uh, Say it again. Uh, that should be okay because it should just look in the global context. But um, but yeah, let me just go up and repeat this. Maybe there might be something along those lines that I'm missing. Um, okay, well, let me just hack this for the moment. This is not how I would usually want to do this, but let me uh, let me put uh, let me put n in the uh, actual function. I will when I upload stuff, sort of final versions of everything. I'll I'll go ahead and fix this. Okay, so that executed, executed really quickly, I guess, because this test fund is not hard to execute. Um, oh, I know why it executed really quickly, because before, and when I did the for each, I had set it up to take the mean of uh, 10 million numbers. And when I just hacked this, I, I sort of lost track of what I was doing, and I set it up to take the mean of only 100 numbers. So doing that is really fast. So this is obviously something where you don't need to do it in parallel. but um, but the syntax, you know, if I changed n to be a bigger number, then it, then it would be more obvious. Um, it would be a, a slightly better example. Um, but basically, you basically can take any, any L or S apply. There's a par L apply and a par S apply. You can make, take any one of those and, and do it, um, do those kinds of applies in parallel. Um, and then there's also, th this one is not very different. The, f the syntax is a little bit different. There's also a function called mcl apply, and that basically does something very similar. You don't need to do all of this setup with the make cluster when you do mcl apply. You can just tell it how many cores you have with the mc.cores argument, and its, its syntax is very similar, and it's going to do basically do the same sort of thing. It's, it's a version of variant of l apply that will do things with multiple cores. That's why it's called mc, so it's doing it, uh, it's doing this parallelized uh, calculation as well. Um, oh, okay. So I guess I sort of fixed the code here and didn't quite fix it. I meant to have two separate examples, one of which was the par s apply, which is this chunk of code, and then one of which is the mcl apply, which is this chunk of code, but I didn't manage to separate them cleanly. Okay, so this is just a comment from, like I said before, about thinking about Split, how you split up into, into many small or a few large tasks. Okay, so any questions about the parallel apply stuff? So again, the goal is just to show you some things that you can do pretty readily uh, on the fly without having to change a lot of the, of the code that you've written. Um, and then the last thing I think I want to say is um, a little bit about random number generation. So we have to be a little bit careful about generating random numbers when we're working in parallel. Um, and I've already said this thing about they're not really random. They're taken from this long deterministic sequence. And it matters where you choose to start. And that's going to determine what random numbers you get. So I've, I've titled this the good, the, ag the bad, and the ugly. So the worst thing that could happen is if you were doing, say, bootstrapping or some sort of simulation study, and on each of your parallel, each of your tasks, you used the same random number seed and you didn't actually have, you actually did the same calculations on the, same, on the different processors. So you weren't actually getting any, any benefit. So you know, if, you, if you happen to, to, to set things up so you set the seed to be the same seed in each of your 
each of your for each calculations or each of your parallel L apply or S apply calculations, um, that obviously would, would cause big problems. Another possibility is that for each of the processes where you're generating random numbers is that you set the seed to be a different seed for each of the different tasks. Okay? And that in general would work fine, but there is a slight danger, although it's fairly unlikely, that in setting the seed for, say, task one, it happens to be here, and then maybe when you set the seed for task two, maybe it's way over here, and you're, not ge you're only generating these random numbers in task one and using these random numbers in task two. But it's possible that when you, that when you set the seed, the seed for the first task would, set, would start from getting random numbers from here, and then just by happenstance, whatever the seed happened to be for the second task, you start to get random numbers from here, and your blocks of random numbers might overlap between the different processes. For some random alg algorithms that use random numbers, that might cause problems, or in other cases, it might not. But in general, that's the sort of thing that you, you would want to stay away from um, if you can. It's sort of, particularly if you're not using a lot of random numbers in, in, whatever, in any particular process or task, it's sort of, it's not all that likely, but, but if, you want, if you want to be uh, strict about it, then you want to try and avoid that. So the way to do it is to basically use an algorithm, such as an algorithm that this guy, Le Cuyer, came up with, where you make sure that each process gets a distinct block of random numbers. And so you're basically taking this long stream of deterministic pseudo-random numbers, and if you know you have 100 processes that are going to need random numbers, then what you do is you take this long stream, you allocate these random numbers to the first, block, uh, first process, you allocate the next block to the second process, this block to the third process, and so on and so forth. So you make sure that the random numbers in each of the processes are distinct. So this algorithm has been implemented in an R package called Le QA, um, and if you're using for each and doing random number stuff within the iterations of for each, you can use something called uh, you can use something called the do RNG package, and in that case, we saw this percent do par percent uh, syntax. You can use percent do RNG instead. If you're using the MCL apply, um, there's an argument there that will basically allow you to make use of this Le Cuvier, um algorithm. So there's some, uh, th and I, I have some more details on this in some notes from another tutorial that I gave uh, last year, so if you wanted more details on that, you could go there. And then there's sort of an ugly way to do it that's, that's a safe way to do it, but might not work in all cases because it might involve just too much computation and passing numbers around. But you could just generate all your numbers on the master process and then manually give out the blocks of random numbers to the different processes. So that's sort of a workaround if, uh, if, you, if, you're, if, you don't wanna, if you don't wanna get into the details of this low QA business. Okay, so any questions or comments about that? Okay. Uh, there's a little bit of a comment here on using uh, for each um, and these par, par S apply, par L apply. If you are doing distributed computing and you've got multiple nodes, uh, I will leave that for you to look at if you're interested. Um, so let's do this. You know, it's getting to be the end of the day. Um, there's a breakout here that you're um, welcome to work on. Um, I will just go ahead and make my closing comments from session 12 and then. I'm going to be around for a little while afterwards, so you're welcome to hang out if you're really interested in parallel processing and want to try this out while, while I'm here to help you with any errors. Um, or you're, of course, um, welcome to head out. But let me just close by um, with a few slides from the last uh, session, which is session 12. So this is basically just where to get more information. Um, and going on from here, and just a sort of a few comment, final comments about, uh, about R. We've already sort of seen that there's lots of stuff you can do with R. It's really powerful. It's really flexible. It's also in some ways kind of disorganized. And as I commented in, in reaction to the question about, can I, you know, are some packages better than others? This, um, I, I was going to make the comment here that some, some actually are better than others, and some, some you might not want to use because they might not be particularly trustworthy. Um, and there are some um, what I'm calling features of R that are actually sort of disadvantages of R that we've some of which we've already seen and just to um, sort of truth in advertising of um, things that R you know probably doesn't do all that well. Um, and then just to point you to a few other places for information, I, I based a little bit of this boot camp off of this other boot camp that this guy um, in Wisconsin created. So there's a there's a um, some other boot camp information there if you're looking for a, a somewhat different perspective on things. There are lots of manuals and contributed help and tutorial information on the R CRAN website. 
Um, and then DLab, which is our co-sponsor, um, which is the co-sponsor with the statistics department of this uh, boot camp, also has shorter sort of two-hour workshops um, that, that present information at a, at, a, at a more basic level. And they also hold boot, uh, workshops on Python and other computing topics. So you may want to check out their um, website. And they also have people who will assist you with um, computing and, and um, analysis problems um, at their drop-in office hours. So that might be something you want to take advantage of. And then I'm just listing a few books here that provide a lot more details about R if you need to delve into sort of nitty-gritty details. Actually, I should have put um, the books, uh, Hadley, any books that Hadley Wickham has on, say, on ggplot2 here as well. Um, but actually, now, the nice thing about computing books is they're often available as electronic books. So you can get access to two of these books through the Berkeley Library catalog. Um, and these other uh, books are just available free from this guy named Paul Morell, who does a lot of work with uh, R graphics. So that's all we have for you. I hope this has been useful. Um, I will ask you if you didn't get a chance to do the, um, the feedback form during the breakout to, to do that over sometime over the next couple days. Uh, and I, thanks, and I hope you found this to be helpful. And I do want to also um, have a round of applause for the assistants. Some of them who were here yesterday were not here uh, today, but for Chris and Jacob and Laura and Jared and for John Stiles in the back who helped a lot with log logistics and who's part of DLab. So thank you to all of you. And then the last thing I'll say is I'm going to clean up a few things, make sure I get all the solutions for all the breakouts uh, posted, and I'll put those all up as a new zip file on the vSpace site, site, and I'll push all the changes up to the GitHub site as well. So if you want, you probably uh, want to wait for a couple days to go get those versions, but they'll be up there soon.